welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. So, as Sam Harris would say, time for a little bit of housekeeping. The last episode we put out there, on Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, and Steve Pinker, I've probably received more comments on that than any other episode that we've ever put out. And that's cool, that's great. I did, in fact, welcome comments on the video. Some were positive. A large number were negative. And I wanted to take a minute to address some of those concerns. You might not like what I have to say, but if you did express a concern, I encourage you to listen. I guess the first point to make is this is an interview podcast. I invite guests from all sorts of different backgrounds and all sorts of different ideological perspectives on, and we deal in controversial ideas. So you're going to hear stuff on this podcast that you don't agree with. And disagreement can be disagreeable. You won't always like having your views attacked or your favourite figures attacked. So that's the first thing, and maybe I'll return to that point. But that is kind of a cop-out. I am not hiding behind my guest on this one. At least in the case of Jordan Peterson, I more or less stand by what we said. So let's get into this. And... By the way, just to flag in advance, I'm not at all complaining about being attacked. That's fine. If you put your views out on controversial topics, you're going to get criticism. I just think the criticism's wrong. So the first and probably the biggest criticism we got was that we were using a straw man, that we had unfairly labelled Jordan Peterson a misogynist without any evidence at all. We'd hung that label around his neck like an albatross and that our entire argument was just the intellectual equivalent of a snake eating its own tail. But I listened to the episode again, and that, that isn't the case. We cited specific statements of his that we felt were, to put it mildly, not accurate representations of the world, and attacked him on that basis. Now, you might not agree with our attacks, but it doesn't work to say as so many of you said, that he simply didn't say these things. So I'll take only the quote that I attributed to him, which many people accused me of lying about, that Jordan Peterson denies not only the contemporary, but the historic oppression of women. So this is a clip I'm going to play for you of Jordan Peterson. You can hear him in his own words. This is on Tucker Carlson's show. Um, talking about the idea that history has been patriarchal. And I'm going to play you the entire answer so that there's no accusation that I might be taking his words out of context. And this, by the way, is something he says all the time. I researched this in, in preparing to do this introduction. I could play you a dozen clips of him saying exactly the same thing. But anyway, this one was the first one I found, and it's fairly succinct. So this is Peterson on Tucker Carlson's show. You're saying that there is an organized, not always explicit, but still organized attempt to de-emphasize masculinity or to punish masculinity. Why? Because, because it's easy to mistake masculine competence for the tyranny that hypothetically drives the patriarchy. It's part of a ideological worldview that sees the entire history of mankind as the oppression of women by men, which is a dreadful way of looking at the world, a very pathological way of looking at the world. It's not like men and women always get along any more than men and men get along, or women and women for that matter. But fundamentally, human history is a cooperative enterprise, and men and women have lifted themselves out of the mire over millennia in their cooperative endeavor. And to describe that as centuries of the oppression of men by of women by men is an absolute, absolutely reprehensible ideological rewrite of history. And it's what's taught in the humanities and in much of the social sciences at universities and increasingly in the public education system. It's taken as an unassailable fact. And, and you're saying so, that this has... On the basis of that, I mean, I don't know what you guys heard there, but obviously human history has been patriarchal. Obviously. And 
let me defend the view. This, to me, is like, it is reasonable to assume that someone might be a misogynist on the basis of that. Why? Because ideas and thoughts are linked together. If someone denies the Holocaust, it is quite reasonable to assume that in addition to that empirical belief about history, they also hold normative beliefs about Jews that are problematic. If someone to, was to say that the African slave trade didn't happen, it would be a pretty good indicator that they also hold problematic views about black people. Now, how dare I say that? I can hear people saying that the treatment of women is nothing like the Holocaust, and this is a disgusting slander. I'll come back to that point. But first, let me use an example I think will be intelligible to Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson listeners. Consider the case of women in Pakistan, right? This is arguably one of the worst places in the world today to be a woman. Every year in Pakistan, thousands of women are killed by their close relatives in what we would call honor killings, because they have done, or are even alleged to have committed, some supposed sexual indiscretion, brought dishonor on their family. They are tortured and killed, often with pure legal impunity. Almost every position of religious, economic, or political power in that society is held by a man. Indeed, women are explicitly denied access to such positions. More than that, the beating of wives by husbands is not illegal and is societally accepted. It is commonplace. Other such atrocities like acid attacks on women and so on are normalized and tolerated. And if you look at the scale of the suffering there, from a pure utilitarian perspective, it is staggering. Thousands of women a year are victims of honor killing. And if you look at the, the homicide rate on women in general, it's something like eight to ten times higher than the overall homicide rate in the US. People like Sam Harris are quite correct to point out that this is not a time for cultural relativism. This is not a time to say that all societies are different but equal. No. Any good feminist, and I think most feminists will, should stand to condemn Pakistan. It is also obviously the case that if you look at the overall way that gender roles are approached in Pakistan, it doesn't make any sense to say what's wrong with Pakistan. Pakistan is the historic norm. Most societies in human history, certainly most societies in the Western tradition, from classical times through almost until the last century, by far resembled Pakistan more than they resembled our own. Now, of course, the particular cultural expressions of that, the religious ideology used to justify that, will be different from case to case. But before we get all culturally superior in looking at Muslims in the Middle East, consider the stark and terrible lunacy that was witch-burning in the medieval period in the Christian tradition, where millions of people, some men but overwhelmingly women, were arrested, subject to state-sanctioned torture, and murdered, often burnt alive, for reasons that are as unintelligible, as fantastical, and as starkly misogynistic as any member of the Taliban or ISIS at their very worst. I mentioned the Holocaust. How dare I say such a thing? How dare I compare the treatment of women to what is one of the worst crimes, maybe the worst crime in human history? Well, the overall number of women burnt during the witch-burning period as an absolute number was roughly comparable to the number of Jews killed in the Holocaust. And as a percentage of the society, surely much larger. But the truth is actually much worse than that. Honor killings or witch burnings, the, the, the most overt and the most publicized aspects of male violence against women, are actually just the tip of the iceberg against 
an overall societal norm, and I'll speak only for the Western tradition here, there may be some examples in world history that I'm not thinking of, but they would be the exceptions, an overall norm where male violence against women is the norm of male and female interactions with each other. In the his work, The Subjection of Women, John Stuart Mill said famously, and has been attacked for it ever since, that there is no slave who is a slave in quite so much as the term as a wife is. It sounds preposterous, but let's just consider this for a minute. To hear Jordan Peterson tell it, you would think that human history was tough and rough, and to adapt to that, men and women voluntarily adapted a gender-based division of labour, with men taking on the more economic roles and women taking on the more family roles, and this was an adaption to challenging circumstances. Nothing could be further from the truth. Through all of Western history, from classical times until maybe a hundred years ago, men held all the legal power over their wives, including the power to beat them physically, including the power of sexual access to their bodies, with or without their consent. Marital rape only became illegal in the UK in 1992, let us remember. It is, of course, the case that many husbands and wives have loved each other deeply and have cooperated, as Peterson says, to pull themselves out of terrible circumstances. But let us remember that until the past century, whenever any married woman, which is what, perhaps 40% of all the human beings who've ever lived, whenever any married woman was not beaten, exercised autonomy over their own body, decided when they would and would not have sex, when they would or would not bear children, and cooperated and formed partnerships with their husband or had other meaningful relationships, whenever they did any of those things, they did so with the permission of their husband. Permission that could, and often was, denied at any moment. So even in the best case, even in the case where women were treated well by their husbands, in cases where they did, as Peterson said, cooperate, they were quite literally slaves with kind masters. Why does Mill say it is an even more extreme form of slavery? Well, because not only did they have no choice, most women, again, through the Western tradition, did not choose to marry their husband, they were literally sold by their previous owner, their father. But they were raised from birth. They were ideologically indoctrinated by their families and their entire societies to believe that the best that they could achieve in life was to be submissive and to please their husband. They were denied by social custom and by law any opportunity to, uh, to participate in education, any opportunity to further the higher parts of themselves, any opportunity to learn. Now, of course, women were not the only ones so subjugated. There were many times and places where race, class, other variables have also been the tools of oppression. And it is also the case, of course, that men have oppressed and been violent towards other men. Certainly, it's probably the case that more men have died in wars, again, at the hands of other men. There is no comparable history of female violence against men. There's none. There's no moment, at least in the Western tradition, and I may be missing something here, where women burned men alive in their millions. It hasn't happened. There is no moment in the Western tradition where men feared for their lives from women, excepting the odd female monarch who maybe pops up as a fluke in the hereditary system. But even in those cases, the actual killing was most likely done by men. Just look at what half of mankind has endured for all of the history of settled societies. Half of mankind has been born owned in a way that men are not. They have been raised, their minds poisoned, to believe that submissiveness and compliancy 
are the highest goods. They have been denied education, even though we know from history that women have fought for it since the earliest times. They have then, occasionally women might escape, lead their own lives, wealthy women in particular, and even poorer women occasionally might lead lives of chastity in a a monastery, but most women have been sold to another man without their consent. Most men have, most women, sorry, have been subject to that man's every whim. And if that man has treated them well, and if they have cooperated, and that woman has achieved love and meaning and betterment with that man, they have done so with that man's permission. And that's the very best case. Think of the worst. Think about every time, if you're a man listening to this, you've been in a bar and you've just got a feeling that some man around you isn't safe. You can just tell, just with his eyes, his body movement, a threatening turn of phrase. You know not to be around him. You just know it. Through most of human history, there have been uncountable millions of such men, probably more in the past than they are today, and the vast majority of them have had some poor woman shackled to them, legally and socially unable to leave them, subject in the privacy and the darkness of the home to whatever violence he chooses to inflict on her. This has been the norm of human history. And where women have been treated well, it's been with permission of men. Now, to say that that doesn't exist puts you in my mind in the same intellectual camp as a Holocaust denier. They're not the same thing, obviously, but it is an intellectual and moral error of the same order of magnitude, maybe even more so. And this brings me to a broader point, is the context in which Peterson is saying this, and the overall discursive standards we employ towards each other. Context in which he's saying this is he is preaching this to an army of young men, some minority of which are deeply troubled in terms of their sexuality. Just read the comments on any of his videos. The clip I just played you has men calling women all sorts of things, which I won't repeat here, and comparing the position of men today to that of African slaves. We are that dominated by women, apparently. What are the odds that these people have healthy, functioning relationships with women? Would you take an even money bet that the person who wrote that has a girlfriend who is mature and loves him very much? You'd almost bet your life that they don't, right? Jordan Peterson has real power, and he's using it not only to deny what he's arguably the principal fact of human history, that half the human race has been enslaved by another half of the human race. He's not only doing that, but he's telling us, and I'm just going to quote directly, that anyone who notices that fact about history, and this is a quote, is pathological, is reprehensible. Go back and listen to the quote, that's what he said. Anyone who looks at history and sees, notices that Almost everyone in power has been a man, and in almost every marriage, all the power has been with the man. Anyone who notices that is, again, to quote him, pathological and reprehensible. And this brings me to my final point, is that these figures in the intellectual dark web have introduced into our discourse a standard for how we talk to each other, which gives all of the power to their side and which unfortunately so many of you seem to have bought into, and I just think is incorrect. This is the standard. Jordan Peterson can go on any TV show and say things that are demonstrably incorrect about the social justice movement. He can say that we are as bad, and he said this many times, as Maoists in China, that our views necessarily lead to the genocide of millions. I don't think... Jordan Peterson could accurately describe the moral and intellectual foundations of my worldview if his life depended on it. They can slur us, they can straw manners. Think about what Jordan Peterson said about social justice types. Think about what he said just in that video. But if we respond in kind, not even in kind, if we respond simply by accurately describing what this man has said, Everyone, everyone is so concerned, so concerned for his free speech, 
so concerned that he might be being unfairly attacked. Where is your concern for the people he unfairly attacks? Of the people who complained to me, how many have complained to Jordan Peterson that he called us Maoists, that he said we long for genocide? Have you complained about that? And I think there's a problem in general with how we think about this. And this is the topic of today's episode. I actually wasn't planning on releasing this bit of audio. I was thinking of doing a supporter-only bonus episode. But I decided it was, you know, I wanted to reply to some of this. And I thought this was a good opportunity to do so. So in this episode, we're going to talk about discrimination and free speech. And I encourage people who think we were being ridiculously unfair in the last one to actually just listen to what we're saying. People on the left are admonished all the time, sometimes reasonably, that we need to do more to understand the opinions of the other side. We shouldn't just straw man them. Let's really get into it. What are people like Peterson and Harris really asserting? That's an okay admonishment, but I turn it back on their fans. Make an effort in reverse. Could you really tell me what social justice types believe in a way that isn't insulting and in a way that would be intelligible to social justice types? I'm not sure that you could. I'll end with this. I remember when I was 11 or 12, there was a bully in our middle school who forever would be mean and degrade my friends, would call them names, would physically assault them, would push them over. He would forever like to put his hands in people's faces in a way designed to trigger them. And I remember one time when he was trying to put his hands and rub dirt in the face of my friend. I just gave him a good hard shove. Didn't hurt him, but knocked him to the ground. He immediately started crying. And I was called into the teacher's office with him blubbering away about how I had been picking on him. I, I, had, I, had, I had pushed him down. I had done all this and plus stuff that he invented that I never did. Little tears coming out of his eyes. That sack of shit. I still, you can hear it in my voice, am annoyed by. Jordan Peterson and his movement is the intellectual equivalent of that in a nutshell. And you need to see it. And if you can't see it, I don't know what I can do to make you see it. But that's my response. And, you know, you might not like it, but I would encourage you to do what you are forever admonishing people on our side to do, which is to make an effort to understand these points of view. So, that may be more than you wanted, or needed, and certainly expected on this. And I don't intend to get stuck on this. Next week, we'll be moving on to other topics. But I felt it would be remiss of me not to address some of these points. So, with our longest preamble ever done, let's get into today's show. Existential Comics' Cory Mola is back. This will be the final part of this series. And yeah, I hope you will join and listen. I, you know, we seems like we lost some followers and gained a few different ones from last episode. That's fine. No one's under any obligation to listen to this show much less to give me your Patreon dollars. It's fine if people don't want to listen. But I just think it would be unfortunate if a, if a large percentage of men, and it will be men in our society, walled themselves off from listening to any point of view that disagreed with theirs because they feel it disrespects their favourite figures. I think that would be unfortunate. Anyway, I've talked for a very long time. I might revisit these issues at some point, but no time soon. That's my response. Feel free to tell me on social media how I'm reprehensible and, um, what was it, pathological, according to Jordan Peterson, because I noticed that women have not fared well historically. Back to Corey from Existential Comics. hear this uh, a lot about like Hollywood. This is something that I kind of worked on and I never finished the work. To pu- I was going to publish this like a, as a blog or something. I do this all the time, you know, but uh, do you know, like, like Terry Gilliam, 
when Monty Python was making this Don Quixote movie and it get, got canceled. And this is kind of a side point. Mm. And he says this thing that a lot of people say. They're like, man, if only I were a black, lesbian, Muslim, I would have got my show greenlit. Because all they want to do is give it to these minorities just because they're a minority. They don't want to give any shows to white men anymore. Right. right? I, I've heard that same sentiment. This is the same so thing. People put it, oh, it yeah. would it help to get me, my book published if I were a black, Muslim, uh, you know, whatever. All right, They yeah, combine yeah. all the minority statuses into one person. Then, oh boy, they would have such an easy time getting published because all these publishers want this diversity. So I thought that's it's an interesting thing to take this seriously. And say, okay, we're talking about movies, right? He was trying to make a movie. And so I went and I looked uh, at top 100 most expensive movies ever. Right? The most expensive movies ever made. Like, this is where the money is going, right? It's one thing to talk about movies being made, but we're talking about where the dollars are being spent, right? Right? How many of those would you expect were black, lesbian, Muslims? I mean, I'm going to say none. In a wheelchair, right? Everybody knows zero, right? How many were women at all? Were there any? Uh, sort of. So actually, I think it's changed. I went back. I This was like so long ago that I had the... the so the top 100 most expensive movies, this is no inflation. So these are almost all movies right now. Okay. In the last thing. That's one thing to realize. This is recent. But presumably so the representation of women is in the past. Of, yeah, yeah. You don't want to know about the 50s. Yeah. But I didn't restrict the dates, but it kind of is self-restricting because of inflation. Hmm. Um, so the first time I did it, there were uh, only two. Hmm. So 98 of the movies were directed by a single person, hmm. solo director, right? 98 of the movies were directed by men. 98 solo directors, all men. There were two movies that were directed by women. One was Frozen, which had a man co-director who was listed first, Mm. right? And the other was Jupiter Ascending, which was directed by the Wachowskis, uh, who are two transgender women. And at the time of the movie, only one of them had come out. So there's no solo directed. So it was sort of like, you could sort of say Jupiter Ascending was directed by one man and one woman, because as far as they knew... One of them hadn't come out yet. And the other thing, of course, about Jupiter Ascending is they made their reputation as men with the Matrix. Right. right? So if you want to be a woman director, you can't really say, first, be born a man, and then make one of the most iconic movies of all time in the Matrix, a movie which you never would have gotten if you were a woman. Right. And then they'll give you some money later on for your projects. So it was basically zero. Since then, Frozen has been kicked off the list. So Jupiter Ascending is the only one. Uh, so, and I think, I think this latest time I only got down to 50, but there were only two black people in the top 50. And I think there weren't any in the bottom 50 either. Um, I'm not sure. So, which was, uh, one of the Fast and the Furious movies and Black Panther. So if you want to be a director in Hollywood, it's not even close to the proportion of the demographics. It's 100% white men directing these movies, basically. Yeah. Or 98%. Right? With the odd here and there. Yeah. They'll give some movies to these people. They'll give a few hundred thousand dollars to make an indie movie, but they're not going to let you direct blockbusters. And even the producers, I, I also looked at the producers and the, um, the writers, and those were like 95%. The writers were like 95% men. The only ones were really Disney movies where they let women write which were a lot of princess movies, by the way. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not really feminism. Uh, and, and then even the producers were like 80%. Right? So if you look at those stats, Hollywood is one of the most sexist industries in the world. There are more CEOs of like probably oil companies and fucking Sil- Silicon Valley companies that are women than Hollywood directors. But in the narrative... Hollywood is controlled by feminists and hates white men, doesn't give them projects, is obsessed with political correctness, is obsessed with diversity. It's just not the case. Well, what, white men control Hollywood through well, and through. Well, what happens is at one point, one of those white men goes, you know what? We need to find a black woman to direct a movie. And so yeah. they go, hey, we're looking for a black woman. 
And even just that then gets Terry Gilliam reacting, going, you see? You see? You see? Because it's explicit. Right. That's the other thing is people, yeah. it's, it's, it's like, because like white men control so much, mm. and if you're going to try to stop that, you have to be consciously explicit. You have to consciously, explicitly look for minorities. Whereas, since white men already control Hollywood, you don't consciously look for white men. It just happens. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, nobody's like, we're looking for a white male director. They don't say that out loud. So if you're kind of dense, if you're not very clever, I mean, you that... see this as white men are getting discriminated against to be sympathetic. Because you see, it's the same thing with sort of like... Uh, like trying to admit more black people into colleges, like these ideas. Affirmative you know, action or something like affirmative that. Affirmative action, yeah. It's explicit compared to implicit. Right. So all the biases that benefit white men are implicit. They're not said out loud. Yeah. They're not written down on paper. It all just happens. And so if you're kind of stupid, you can see, like, look at them intentionally discriminating against white men. Yeah. Even though the reality is, like I said, all the movies, all the movies are directed by white men. So what do you get? Do you get a feminist? Are you going to expect a feminist movies to come out of that? Like well, this sort of messages? like this sort Not of really. like a pseudo feminism, and you can yeah. you, you can sort of tell feminism when it comes from men usually. Yeah, yeah. So the Hollywood people like these men so, 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 these something movies. like the girl with the dragon tattoo or something like that. Yeah, well, it's yeah, avowedly feminist. Like you still see a lot of tits and ass, but you know she's being oppressed and yeah, stuff yeah, as well. You know so. It is true, these people are absolutely true, that these men who are directing the movies are more liberal than the society at large. Yes. That's true. That's true. So they're complaining about that. Like feminists, more, more, social justice more are socially, Hollywood. More socially liberal. More you socially wonder liberal. how many yeah, of social. them want to empower the workers or whatever. But yeah, that's yeah, an aside. Of course. But they are more so because they live in cities mm. and they're artists. That's always been the case of people, you know what I mean? It's not like a mystery why this is. And same they work with, same with Silicon Valley CEOs or yeah, whatever. Yeah. They're like, sort of technically more socially liberal the, these, than These aren't America. people who handle snakes in church or anything like that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they're still horribly, I mean, it's from the Me Too movement and everything, it's like Hollywood is still horribly misogynist. Yeah. Because if you put men in charge of everything, and women desperately want to be actresses, you can see what happens. It's not a right. mystery how this happens. Look, if 50% if fifty of the women making casting decisions and making who is greenlining these movies, right. if it were 50% men and 50% women directing these movies, greenlighting the movies, this stuff would be a lot different. I'm not saying there would be no sexual harassment, but an actress could get in a movie without any men approving her. Right now, every actress that wants to get in a big blockbuster movie, a man has to cast her. Right. A man has to tell her, yes, you're allowed. What the hell? Why is this? I can hear people saying, but now the Me Too movement's gone too far and there's all these false accusations and yeah, uh, women just, are using just, it as a way to gain power. You can just one, smear a good man's name and blah, blah. <laughs> I'm not saying I agree with this, yeah. but blah, blah, so, blah, 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 blah. blah. And again... It's like, good. Let the fires wash over the earth, you know? <laughs> Fuck it. Destroy all of Hollywood for all I care. Oh, no. I don't care if men... It's not the biggest tragedy on earth that a hundred men were fucking removed from their position of power. For one, it's not the biggest tragedy Of at all. which 95 yeah. unquestionably deserved it. And yeah, there's maybe five cases where the, the one, evidence could go either here's way. The thing. They can't ever point to one that was false. Where, there's, there's some. Oh, I'm trying to. Uh, there's some that are gray or whatever, but it's like fine. The other thing is like I would like Hollywood to be destroyed. I would like women to gain power. So in something. Th th there's I been you, there's been a I few like the lacrosse thing where there's a bunch of people accused of rape and it turned out she'd just been completely making it up. There, there, yeah, there's like there's the individual occasional one. Uh, yeah, but they're not representative. It's not, yeah, uh, position of power like these powerful. No, no Hollywood. No powerful people in Hollywood have been taken down unjustly. I don't believe. It. And when one, powerful people have, it's been Weinstein yeah. or something was overwhelming. And I think uh, there's probably like here's here's a question that you could ask: Is what percentage of people who have done any sexual harassment or inappropriate behavior in Hollywood have been outed? 
through Me Too? What percentage are like what percentage of people in their entire life have done a bunch of pretty bad shit and nothing has come up? I would say like probably one in a hundred have been outed right now. No less. <laughs> I mean, so so this track stood as, one in as... a thousand. There's so many guys out there, casting directors who forced women to do things. It's not public. The Me Too has not gone too far. Me Too has not even come close to far. It should be hundred times more powerful. It should be. They should all be cast out. If every man in Hollywood right now lost their job and we reinvented Hollywood from scratch, it would be better. Right. But even if they were all innocent, I don't give a shit, you know? But isn't it probably the case that most... So we've got the... I don't know if you're following the Kavanaugh hearings where he's been accused of trying to rape a girl when he was 17. That is not as well evidenced as some of this stuff, but if I had to bet money, I'd say, yeah, that probably happened. And my reasoning is just cynical. I think most men particularly most men of that age, have done something like that. I mean, here's the logic. I don't have a single female close friend who doesn't have a Me Too story. That's not to say, like, every single one's been raped or anything, but every single one of them has had multiple men, often in supervisory positions over them, do something weird or creepy. So if it's happened to almost all women, that's got to mean it's a majority of men have done something like that. Yeah, a large amount. And men like him, you know... Yeah. <laughs> that kind of culture he came from. It's like, give me a fucking break. Of course he did. Yeah. You know, of course. But uh, yeah, in Hollywood, it's like they all have. Yeah. And also, it seems to have been culturally reinforced in Hollywood. Yeah, reinforced. If you're a big shot, because, you get your pick of the actresses or whatever. Yeah. And if they didn't do what you wanted, then they would be blacklisted, which happened with Harvey Weinstein. You know, directly. Peter Jackson said he directly blacklisted. You know? And so if you're talking about Me Too going too far, I mean, because one guy had shoddy evidence. For one, hardly any of these people's careers have been ruined. Hardly any of them. Yeah. Most of them are still working. It's not even close to far enough. As far as I'm concerned, until women are making the decisions, right? Like, or at least a proportional. A proportional, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah or at least. Who gives a shit? 70% of them would be yeah. women, and would probably be better. It should be that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But, uh, yeah, at least 50-50, right? At least. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's like Me Too hasn't gone far enough. I've, I've heard never people felt. say so many times in apparent earnestness, and you'll never get Sam Harris saying something this overtly stupid, but you, you get the sense he kind of believes it, and the people who follow him have taken this message that white men are now the oppressed minority. And yeah, sure. coming from a white man like... Again, do you, do you have any sense of your own self-awareness? Do you have any sense of irony that you're accusing people of being snowflakes and overreactive and yeah. you, 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 you're critiquing quote-unquote victim culture and yet you're being a victim you're doing the same. but worse, you're doing it without reason, with the opposite of reason. With the opposite of reason, yeah. Anyone who looks around the world and thinks white men are being oppressed it's hard to even believe, like, do they really believe this? It's I think I think they do. I think some I think people do, do. It's hard to say. I think... Well, but the one... I yeah. do want to make one more point yeah, about yeah. Me Too thing, which is sort of this, like, it's kind of a liberal feminism, and this is the feminism of Hollywood. Hmm. They like to focus on representation. So they'll say, like, how many women are getting roles? Hmm. How many lead roles are women? Right? That's their idea of representation. Uh, which, by the way, it's still mostly men. Mm. Like, you can look at... I, I tried to make a bot at one point, too, that would look at IMDb and count how many movies were being released with a majority female cast. Mm. And it's like... Uh, God, I can't... I have the stats somewhere on my computer. This is another blog post I tried to write, like, two years ago and just forgot yeah, about yeah. it. I love movie stats, by the way. This is why. It's showing. It's actually not... It's the movie it's stats showing. I love more than feminism, by far. I love <laughs> But, we're, uh, we're not we're not really woke bros. We just no, we just no. like IMDb I just, I or something. I love IMDb and I love. I wish their data was more public so you could do mm. deeper stuff. But I looked into how many movies had a majority uh, top five billing of mm. women, and it's like almost not. Right. And it has almost not changed at all since the fifties. It was like sixteen percent back then. It was like twenty percent now. These are numbers I don't have off. I don't have it off the top of my head, so don't trust it. I did make a tweet about this at one point, sure. but. Uh, this is kind of the liberal feminism that is the worst, uh, which is representation in who is playing roles. How many black women are playing characters that we see with our eyes? And this is very important that there should be some, because 
black women are growing up watching these movies. They need to have their own kind of people represented on screen. But far more important is representation in power. Actors and actresses don't have any power. Who, what is the, how many black women are in charge of green lighting movies? And the answer is none. None of them are. Zero percent, right? It's 0.0 percent. There's no, there's no representation in who actually gets to make the real decisions that affect our lives. Like what is shown on screen. If the fucking actors don't get to decide the lines, right? They don't get to decide how the lines are set. The writers and directors do, and to a greater extent, the executive producers. Which also means that when black people do get roles, they'll often get a role that's an ugly cultural stereotype, yeah. and they'll and they have, have to choose no between effect. reinforcing negative images of and that. Not, you know, or, like, so not getting the role. That's another... If we're talking about representation, I always just want to say, like, representation in power, hmm. not in ser- servitude. You know what I mean? Like, the, the employees are kind of servants to the... They don't get... As a decision-making process, they don't get to make decisions. Hmm. The actors, it's great to have representation, but I want them to have representation in deciding what movies get made. Fine. Right? So there should be black women and black communities. Look, they're, what, 15, 20% of the population or something? They should be green-lighting 15 and 20% of the budget. Right. Right? And right now, it's 0%. Right. So if you want to talk about real representation, it's in who allocate resources as, and decide what movies get made. And that's socialist representation, right? Giving real power to these groups, not just sort of letting them, throwing them some crumbs and saying, look, you get to, look, we let you make Black Panther, you know, that's the good yeah. And you could have, I, I've been in companies where the are majority non-white, but then maybe 5% of the senior leadership is not white. It's, it's, it's like that presentation of overall structural why, problems. Yeah, which is why I always say you can't change these things without changing the structure. Right. So you have, Or destroying the structure. The, the way to change it is to just, look, make everyone have a vote. If you held elections, right, if you're looking at a... a, a Right. You look at a company where you have the management class and they're the top 10 percent mm. and you have the workers and they're all white, mm. basically. And you have the workers who are 85 percent black. Right. Well, let's if you t- were to change this structure of this company or this political campaign into a democratic, one, mm. guess what? They're going to vote for their own people. It's going to be the opposite. The management class will reflect the bottom class because they elected them on their behalf. Right. So this whole thing, that's how to change it. And just to, them a just to build off this a little, there are structural, that's big structural change. There are small structural changes that you can make that are within our power to make and that we reliably don't, um, that would have way more impact. And I think when people legitimately get annoyed with like social justice liberalism, it's when it's performative. When you have some white guy going, oh, you know, I own my white guilt and I feel so bad and I'm so sorry for the history and, and, and like making it about them and their emotions and yeah, then yeah. immediately exiting that and going back to patterns of behavior that are reinforcing that just self-confessed privilege and structures yeah. that are actively screening out. So if I had a choice of like, I have one day to make a company more representative. And I can't do anything radical like have a democracy. And I can either have a diversity seminar or I can go and rewrite all of their job descriptions. Every single time I'd go and rewrite all of their job descriptions and where they post them. And if possible, I'd have the assessment of applicants done blind. Right? Those structural changes by themselves, and I've actually done this in organizations, there's specific things you can do to a job description that will radically alter the racial composition of the applicants you get. So for one thing, yeah. do you really need a fucking MA to do this degree? If you don't, if you, so do you need an MA to do this job? If you don't, why is it on the job description? Because the vast majority of people who have MAs in this country are white and middle class, right? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. one. There's language you can use which will subconsciously signal to people that this is an all-white space. Don't use yeah. that language, right? The more, yeah. um, there's some really funny statistics 
that the more points for requirements you have on a job description, it, it, women and people of color will only apply to jobs if they have 90% plus of the requirements. Men will have a crack at 40%, right? Mm -hmm. So then the upshot is, if you want a diverse applicant pool, have like three requirements. What's the big three things you need to do this job? And then yeah. there's all this data that will be less likely to give someone a callback for an interview if it's a black name as opposed to a white name, right? I'm yeah, sure you've yeah. seen that data. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Really easy fix. Assess resumes blind, right? Yeah. And I actually, I actually was put in charge of a diversity initiative at a company, and I did this, and we went from 70% male applicant pools to 60% female applicant pools with just those changes. And I would, yeah. and that's very, very small structural stuff, right? You yeah. can do it in yeah. 10 minutes. And I would go for the structural stuff any day over than let's have the all white, all male people do a diversity seminar where they all yeah, profess, their, yeah. they profess their guilt about how bad that they feel. Mm -hmm. We're going to listen to more points of view. And then they immediately go back to like making a face in the coffee room when someone who's black and presenting as lower class cuts in front of them. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't buy it. And I think the legitimate critiques of liberalism are when people suspect that it's performative and it, um, not, and there's zero interest in even the most marginal changes to structure. I think that's when people do get legitimately frustrated. That was a yeah. longer point, but it's something I've thought a lot about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of people. Like you're saying, they just want to, it's kind of bizarre, but they want to make politics about themselves in the sense that they want to be a good person. Yes. You know? There's a like religious politics. aspect. It's like a confessional yeah, a or something. Aspect. They're like, I'm one of the good people. I don't want to be racist, but I don't want to do anything. Right. I don't really want anything to change because my life is comfortable. Oh. Right? I'm, I'm doing pretty well. So let's kind of change nothing, but I just want everyone to know that I'm one of the good ones. It's like, who gives a shit? No. I don't give a shit what's going on in your head. I really don't. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I said with Mandisa Thomas, president of Black Nonbelievers, and I've changed my mind on this, I said being a good ally on race is 90% what you do and 10% how you feel. I've changed my mind. It's 0% how you feel. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, you can be a jerk, and if you're willing to invest in changing structures, I'll take that any day yeah. over someone who... I have fucking white friends on Facebook all the time. Just these long essays about how bad they feel and who gives a shit? Black people don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I would say I would pull back a little bit though and say there has been a lot of progress in sort of a again like a Hegelian way of changing our the way we think in our ideas, right? So a lot of some racism is certainly internal ideas of the population poll. That's sort of how it structurally propagates, right? Like with the black names on a resume. Why, why are the black names on the resume uh, rejected more? It's because of internal ideas. And those kind of things, like we've seen, we always, it feels always uh, like no progress is being made in this area. But if you sort of look back 40, 50 years, you can see the attitudes that people have are a lot different. Oh and no! Does make some impact. Oh no! So I'd um, say our, I, and I know you're not claiming this exactly, but uh, yeah, yeah, our internal, like there is another, like a, I guess like a like political correctness and virtue signaling, so called, get a lot of uh, negative press. For one, because like people hate them, reactionaries hate it, and for two, like you're saying, it's performative. But it does set a boundary of what ideas are acceptable and not acceptable. So to some extent, I think in public, like I think in a business setting, having a seminar, that's totally nice. But in public settings, like setting the boundaries of, of what we're, what's supposed to be acceptable to say and to think and what attitudes you're supposed to have does have some sort, sort of a long form, generational even, cultural change to sort of civilize the society. Yeah, so I completely agree, but there is one point I'd like to build off that, which is, yes, absolutely, I think having social norms that we all participate in can be like, so, you know, why can't white guys say the N-word, right? Because, yeah. well, because that is participating in a social norm that acknowledges the history of that word and the history of race or whatever, however implicitly and imperfectly. And also, yeah, I absolutely agree progress have been made when my more radical friends tell me 
stuff is just as bad as it was under slavery. I, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. No. Um, now, with regards to the point about implicit bias, obviously implicit bias is a real thing. Given our history, it would sort of be weird if it weren't, right? And, like, we've yeah. existed in the world. People react differently. That's not to say, like, you're wearing a hood or anything. But people, I mean, I'm white, but I'm white British, so I'm coming at a lot of this a little bit from the outside. White Americans are very aware of the race of people around them. You can just tell that they are, right? That's a true thing. I do think we know less about Im um, implicit bias than we think that we do. And the literature we have says nothing at all about the behavioral effects of it or how you correct for them. Yeah. Um, so I do think if I had, if my only job was to decrease implicit bias in a company, and here's my follow-up point, I would still go with the structural thing of changing the resumes as opposed to some yeah. sort of training. And here's why. Yeah. The one thing we know does impact bias is being in diverse spaces. People who are only surrounded by other white people tend to have the most biases. And so yes. I think... Culture has changed for the better, and part of that is the setting bounds. But it's also just because we see a more diverse range of people in our day-to-day -day lives. So I think yeah. I'd try and change the structure first and hope that the culture follows it rather than the other way around. Because if nothing else, we know how to change structures, and we just don't know very well how to change cultures. So that would yeah, be the point I'd build off that. Sort of one, of one of the points I'm making is, too, that implicit bias changes very, very slow, which is why you feel like we're just as racist as we ever were, and you really have to look all the way back. You can't look at the 90s. You have to look all the way back at the 60s, 50s, you know, and say, wow, ooh, look at that. It's way worse. It is a generational thing. It's like what, what you teach your kids matters. The, the media they're exposed to as, you, as you're young is probably the biggest impact. Like one of the... Like, I think the media really, that's why representation on screen matters. Like, one thing I notice is, like, even seeing Arabic script automatically triggers in my brain terrorism. Because all you see, the only time you see it on the news is, like, when there's guys with AK-47s yelling death to America. Like, I'm talking about just the, the script, you know? And your brain automatically makes associations about everything. So that is ingrained in me subconsciously. It's not that I believe te only terrorists use this language, you know what I mean, like Arabic writing. I don't have any beliefs like that. But my brain automatically, there's like a connection, a neurological connection or something, you know, I don't, who knows how any of that works, that automatically connects ideas. And when I see it, my brain already, it's almost like a computer starts to warm up the terrorism part, just in case you need to start thinking about terrorists, because it's like, oh, this is connected somehow. That kind of stuff doesn't go away for a long time. Maybe for me, never, right? For my kids, maybe, right? For the next generation, because we've raised them in a more s s accepting society or something. I don't know, though. I don't have the answer to this. It's massively complicated. Yeah, and I think that this is an area where, if any, if anything, this is where you need epistemic humility, right? This is where you need to know yeah. we don't know what we don't know. I think it's reasonable to suppose that these implicit biases do exist, but we don't... And, like, whether they can change in one person... I also think, like, the amount that someone's biased um, can change from moment to moment, depending on how much someone's keyed up for it. So, you know, yeah. the, the classic is you're alone um, at night. Are you more scared if the person behind you is black or white, right? That's yeah. one scenario. But then you go into work and you sit next to your friend who you've known for 20 years who happens to be black. The same person yeah, could yeah. be in both scenarios. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess the good news is explicit bias is falling drastically. And, and like, it's not generational, it's too fast. So even you said the yeah, 90s yeah. might be too soon. In 1992, when Bill Clinton was elected, 70% of white Americans said they were strongly opposed to interracial marriage. That number's now 15%, which yeah. is 15% is still that's... way too high. But that's yeah, an astounding you... decrease. Absolutely it's astounding. Insane. And it's actually amazing how quick it can happen. Like the trans rights that are kind of we're in the middle of right now, it seems like it was just incredibly quick. The difference between 10 years ago and now. It's just astounding. Like people didn't had never even heard of 
what are your pronouns? You know, like nobody would ever say those words 10 years ago. No, but somebody's I've, entered the back. I've got friends who I won't name who've gone from when I knew them eight years ago would say things like, forgive me, I'll just sort of, you know, the, 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 the fucking trannies and what are these freaks doing and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. To the same people are now righteously outraged, I guess correctly, that some yeah. state in the Midwest would want to pass a law about bathrooms or whatever. It's, now, of course, they have zero self-awareness about that change, but it is interesting how even in the same yeah. people, it's night and day. Yeah, because it's just entered public consciousness. And I think this is the importance of ideas, like of consciousness, of awareness of issues. Just an idea entering your consciousness and becoming aware of it, it's like you can't help but have it affect you. And that's why these kind of public consciousness campaigns are just massively undervalued by some people, especially like some socialists who, who want to uh, kind of reduce everything to class struggles. It's just clearly not true. Public consciousness ideas, which enter our minds, have an enormous effect on society. And it has nothing to do with class struggles. Yeah, this is something you've tweeted about, right? It's like, yeah, we could do away with all this class stuff. We'd still have sexism. We'd still yeah. have racism. And it's obvious. It's obvious. You, know? you just look at spaces and structures in our societies that sort of operate outside of capitalism with no property relations. And it's like, it doesn't change anything. And some of the socialists will reply to me like, look, oh, it's, we're still in a capitalist society, so it's reflecting capitalists. And that's true. Of course, that's true. Nothing in our society can escape capitalism. Even if you're organizing an event and nobody pays and everybody's just participating, even if you go to the woods and make a hippie commune, you know, you're still in a capitalist society. And it was, you're going to reflect the forces of capitalism on whatever you do. But to go on and just say that's the racism is the result of that is just mad. And that these kind of public awareness ideas is have no bearing on anything. It's just mad. It's just unbelievable. Which, to map it back to our previous conversation, though, is precisely why we're not just being dicks to Sam Harris and um, Jordan Peterson for the sake of it in that they're putting ideas out there on the other side which are doing the opposite, yeah. and they're worth being concerned about. It's worth being concerned that millions of young men are now being told the natural place of a woman is dot, 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 or being told, oh, but don't you know the mean distribution for IQ is genetically yeah. different or whatever? These are ideas that are going to, as they're processed by people, affect their behavior and make lives worse for people who are already disadvantaged. It's, it's, it is worth caring about. And it's worth caring about exposure, too. Mm. Like, oh, I, I wouldn't give a exposure. shit about Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson if they were like yeah. my friends who so have 100 followers. About, which is why people talk about, oh, they're being censored if you don't let them on the news. It's like, no, we should not let them on the news. What we decide goes on the news is a decision. You're deciding always what programs to present to people, what mm. ideas. Someone's not being... Everyone in America is being censored when they show a news program by that standard. You know what I mean? Except for the one person. I'm, who's I'm being idea. censored because I can't get a Because I can't be on. on the news, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't think anyone's saying that they should be arrested or locked up or anything like that. But they that. should not be invited on the news, and they should not be invited to the news. I mean, I'll put it this way. If I was a news producer, I can think of a hundred people, even out of conservatives, who I would invite yeah. on that show, on a show before them. Yeah. But we should be very concerned about what ideas people are exposed to. And it sounds like censorship, but it's like, it's always, it's always a power struggle of somebody controls the media, what ideas are exposed to the population. That is a power struggle that takes place every day. So, of course, people are being censored. You know, of course. They're going to always say, look, we don't want these ideas exposed. We don't want, do they invite union organizers on the news? No. All the day. Are there any union organizers in America who have as much press as Jordan Peterson? No. Yeah. The, and, and the irony of it all is the victim complex of the people who complain yeah. about victim culture is, I mean, we've already made this point, but it's off yeah. the charts in a way that you can't help but find it a little infuriating. Yeah, the, the craziest one was when Steve Bannon got uh, disinvited somewhere. And, and they said he was being censored. And I'm like, that motherfucker owned a newspaper. Yeah. He owned the media. You know what I mean? How can you possibly censor him? But also, if you really... And, and I, I don't... I think, like you said, that libertarians aren't actually concerned about free markets. I think free speech people 
in their heart of hearts aren't concerned by free speech because the cases that they highlight of are all these prominent white men saying conservative things and getting a somewhat frosty reaction. And the greatest threat to free speech is that the, the, the dark web nerds don't get to come in the cool kids' treehouse. Whereas, I, I don't know, I follow a few trans commentators. Not a single one of them doesn't reliably receive death threats, right? Now, you can agree yeah. or disagree with what they're saying. Trans commentators tend to be uber leftists, and maybe there's critiques you can make there. But they don't deserve death threats for saying it, you know? That would be where I would go first for free speech, but they don't care about that at all. Yeah. And I, I remember reading one statistic where they looked back and it was like the number of professors who were fired for something they said, hmm. and like 70% of them were fired for leftist speech. Really? I didn't know that. I mean, I could believe it. I, more, and same thing with that company, right? You're much more likely to get fired for being a leftist. Hmm. Union organizing would be the easiest one. People get fired every day for that, you know, or spreading around communist speech. You know, they're not going to they don't like that. Firing right wing people is actually much more rare. So these insane forces that they're talking about that are censoring people are probably much more likely to censor left wing. They never mention. You never mention libertarians. I've never heard a libertarian concern that someone was fired for union. And theoretically, unions should be fine in a libertarian society. People should be free to form a union and collectively bargain. But you never hear, you never hear, oh, what's the danger? These people are getting fired for union organizing. One guy gets fired for being an anti-feminist. They're very concerned about this. It's, it's just, it's obvious what they're after, you know. Yeah, free speech... Uh, people are almost always hypocritical. The left-wing ones are the same. Of course, they focus on the left-wing ones. It's not only natural to a certain extent, but it's like, come on. They're, and it's sort of the same thing I was saying with the, the representation versus power in Hollywood. Free speech is one thing. Like, who gets invited on the news is one thing, but who makes those decisions is much more important. Who has the power to control the media, to decide? That's where real freedom operates. Those choices need to be made by the people in the country, not by one guy who happens to have a billion dollars, and so he gets to decide everything. So censorship, I'm not as interested in who gets invited to talk and who's censored, who's kicked out of the school, but who gets to make those decisions? Who has the power? Should we pause there? We've done, that was quite a long show. Yeah, quite a bit. Um, thanks for doing this, man. That was, that was a really good chat. Um, I think everyone will have heard of you already, but if listeners, whatever, want to follow you, where should they go? Uh, existentialcomics.com. Existentialcomics on Twitter and Facebook, I guess, you know. 